This is Ken Hans, Best Storyteller, Texas. Today we have a special guest, a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And there's uh, not a lot of those people. There's 3,515 people that have received that uh, over the course of the history of the United States. And uh, our person is Jim McLuhan. And uh, Jim was born in Bangor, Michigan. Not Bangor, Maine. Bangor, Michigan. He was a coach. He was a wrestling coach. He was a basketball coach. When I first saw this, Jim, I thought it was a misprint, but it is Bangor, Michigan, not Bangor, Maine. That is correct. And that where is Bangor, uh, Michigan? Bangor, Bangor is about 10 miles east of South Haven. Um, it's uh, in South Haven's right on Lake Michigan. So we're right on the west coast of uh, Michigan. And um, it, it's a small town. Um, uh, I, I guess our name to claim was uh, from, from your area down there. He played for the Dallas Cowboys. Pete Gent came from Bangor, Michigan. Pete played tight end. Uh, he wrote the book North Dallas 40. That's right. And, and so, was a uh, uh, famous, anyone that's been a Cowboy fan, they know who Pete Gent was. Well, I, I used a lot of the Cowboys uh, plays as a, I, I coached football for 38 years. And I had, a, we had fun. That's now, good. The, the, the Dallas Cowboys have a fun offense. Yep. They, they did. Uh, you, uh, your parents, uh, tell me a little about your parents and any siblings you had. Well, I'm a half Texan myself because my mom was born and raised in Brownsboro, Texas. She was born in Opelika which is no longer a town there. Both of her parents had died before she was three. So she was raised by grandparents down in Brownsboro. Came up when she was 17 years old with an aunt to Michigan. Met my dad and six weeks later, they were married. They met in South Haven, Michigan, where my dad graduated. I went back to my dad's uh, alma mater to coach and teach for four years when I got back from Vietnam. I had uh, two brothers. I'm right in the middle. I have an older brother and a, and a younger brother. My mom had an eighth grade education. She uh, being raised by grandparents and she got to be a handful uh, for a while there. And uh, so she quit in the eighth grade. My dad had a uh, he had a high school education. And then my brothers and I, all three of us uh, were teachers. My older brother was also a coach and we all three have master's degrees. You, you went to Olivet College, uh, the yes, Comets, sir. and, and yeah. were you a Comet? I was a Comet. I played four years uh, on the football team. And I wrestled for four years, and that, by the way, was a sport that I'd never even seen, high school or college wrestling. I was an all-conference basketball player in high school, also played football in high school, baseball, and tr ran track. 11 varsity letters in high school, seven in college. And they never let me forget the first day that I went to wrestling practice was the first day that Olivet College had wrestling. So they were just starting the team when they uh, encouraged me or actually twisted my arm to come and join the team. And I looked around and I said, hey, where's the ropes? I've seen this on TV and they're supposed to be ropes. So while they were recruiting me, I thought they were recruiting me for big time wrestling. It's uh, they've never let me forget that. That's pretty but funny. I was, the, I was the college's uh, very first uh, conference champion as a junior, and I was back to back as a senior. Yep, played football at 160, 165 pounds, and wrestled at 130 pounds. So. What what did you? What position did you play in football? I was a wide receiver and a, a corner on defense. And I held for the extra points and field goals. I was a holder. I was on punt return, kickoff return teams and kickoff and, and punt teams. So, yeah, I ran plays in and out with another wide receiver. So I think that really helped me uh, to fall in love with uh, the strategy of football. And I be, that's I became a coach and it was very valuable for me later on in life. Uh, you gra when did you graduate uh, from high school? Uh, I was only 12 years old, and I, gra <laughs> no, I graduated in 1968. So I'll be 77 in April. And, and when, you, when you graduated, 
did you get drafted immediately? Well, I uh, had signed a contract in May of 68. A uh, recruiter came around from South Haven and I said, wow, I can go back to my dad's high school, you know, and coach and teach. And so I kind of, I signed a contract on May 25th, 68. Then I graduated June 4th. And then I got a letter from an uncle of mine in the middle of June. You probably heard of him. Uncle Sam was his name. And uh, he said that I was to report for a physical in July I took the physical. Of course, I knew I'd pass that. I just got off my second conference title as a, a wrestler. And and uh, I said to the lady, well, I thought they were just trying to see who's healthy and who isn't, you know. She said, oh, you don't know? You're getting drafted. So the assistant superintendent uh, came in and sat before my board and, and informed them that they were seven teachers short. This is the middle of July, and they're going to start the last of August. We're seven teachers short. If you take Jim, we'll be eight teachers short, and we will not be able to replace him in his coaching positions, which at that time was uh, football and wrestling. I raised my hand on the 29th of August and went into the United States Army. And, and basic you training. graduated from college in six Oh, yes. When, yeah, when I, was, I, was, I, was, I was a graduate. I had signed a contract, and I was married, but none of that. When, when did you graduate from high school? 1964. So you went through in four years. Yep. And did wrestling, football. And baseball. And baseball. A couple of years baseball. What mm-hmm. you play in baseball? I was a shortstop second baseman. Okay. In the middle. Uh, in the middle. So they, they sent you to basic training at Fort Knox, but they didn't give you any gold. No, they, they kept it right there in that doggone bank that they have there what whatever that cave is they put it in no they didn't give me any gold they, they gave me a ticket to hell is what they gave me how long were how long were you at fort knox and basic um eight eight weeks eight basic weeks training. and then eight they weeks. sent you to san antonio sent me to fort sam houston and the reason that um because uh, draftees don't get those jobs. Uh, studying to be a coach, I'd taken kinesiology, physiology, anatomy, first aid, advanced first aid, strapping, taping, uh, CPR, you know, the whole bit. And I think that's the reason that they thought I'd be a good fit. And um, my men tell me I was one of the best, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I sure tried to be. And so how long were you at Fort Sam Houston? Um, we were, I was there a little while because we had a break at Christmas time. And so we had a, a little couple of weeks break there, but I was there from November until I think it was the second week in February, because I left the first part of March from, um, Oakland, California to go to Vietnam. And they gave me a two two week break. I actually worked out with a wrestling team then, and uh, they were second in the state and, and two kids I worked out with uh, won a state title that year. So I got to work out a couple of, of weeks with the, the wrestling team at South Haven while I was home. And then it, it, when, when did you find out that you were going to Vietnam? That's a good question too. While at Fort Sam Houston, you know, I'd go to all these classes, and of course, a lot of it I'd already taken, like the uh, first aid cut type of things. And I said, for crying out loud, I got an educational certificate, and these guys don't even, they do the same thing every day. They don't even have to write a new lesson plan. I can do this. So I interviewed all the way up through, uh, I think he was a two-star general, and he said that, you know, you can stay here. You're, you're, the, you're just the fit for us. So we're standing in line last day and they were literally going through every member in my company and telling them where they were going next. And they got to Jim McLuhan and they said, Vietnam, Southeast Asia. And I thought, Oh, they made a mistake. They had to make a mistake. Well, here's where the draftee thing and the regular army, that regular army is the guy who volunteers to go in. Draftee has two years, regular army has three. So I went up to the captain who had been telling all of us where we were going. 
And I said, I think you made a mistake on Jim McLuhan. I'm, I'm staying here. And he, he knew, of course, and he got this very blank look on his face. He said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but a regular army has bumped you and he got your job here and you are going to be a combat medic. I went off into a field. I don't even remember how long I was there. And I will admit that, that I was brought to tears that, that I may never, and I paid, uh, I came from a family that was not wealthy at all. I, I always said we weren't poor. We just didn't have any money. Um, <laughs> I like no, that. no electricity till I was uh, five, no running water till I was eight. But uh, I paid for every bit of my, my education, as did my brothers, because my parents didn't have that kind of money. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm finally where, where I want to be. I spent every dollar that I've ever earned in my life, and, and I might get killed and, and not get to fulfill that, that dream and goal that I had to become a teacher and a coach. But uh, yeah, I would, and, and it was there, though. It was there that I said to myself, Jim, you got to change your attitude. Uh, you got to you got to forget about being a teacher and a coach and you better be the best combat medic and the best soldier that you can be. Or you may never be a teacher and a coach. But you dug down into your character, your your soul to to make yourself know that I've got to do this. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, I was fortunate. I, I tell kids, especially when I'm in small towns. I, I was at a school called Hillsdale in the middle of um, Michigan. There's a Hillsdale College, but I was speaking to Hillsdale High School academic athletes. They're top academic athletes that had not only been all state as uh, performers, but also academically, and their parents were there. And um, I had officiated the AD's college matches, because, and he also was a wrestler for Olivet. So um, that's how I got there. But I told those kids, as I often tell many from uh, a small town, that someday, someday you will fully understand how lucky you were to, to grow up in small town USA because you're like a family in those towns. As a matter of fact, um, I worked for an undertaker there in, in Bangor. That was one of my jobs. And I often tell them bosses or jobs that you have will also prepare you. And he, that job, dealing with him and, and, and uh, working on bodies that, uh, here's an older gentleman, he was at my basketball game two weeks ago, and here he is, you know, I'm working on him, and students from my high school that maybe were in an accident, and I would work with them. It had, it had prepared me uh, for uh, facing death as a combat medic. I did a lot of facing of death, of course. But I, I also, one of my missions when I came home was to prepare my students and my athletes for their Vietnam. And I'll explain that. Their Vietnam might be a class that they, they failed and they should have had, or a girlfriend that says, hey, I don't love you no more. You know, not being accepted at a college their parents divorcing, their house burning down, whatever their Vietnam would be through life, someone had done that for me. And you know what I'm talking about here. Somebody had prepared me for my Vietnam, and I needed to prepare these kids for theirs, whatever it turned out to be. Going back, when you you found out in Fort Sam Houston that you were going to Vietnam, and, and then you had you left from Oakland. I did. That was my first time on a plane. I can remember the look on my father's face. I never saw my father with a worried look on his face, but my father was a World War II veteran. And I think he just knew that that might be the last time that he would see his son. And I looked out the window and I, I thought, boy, I've never seen my dad with that kind of worried look on his face. So, and he was my best friend as well as my dad. Uh, absolutely. And was yeah. it a rough flight or just the, Oh my seats? goodness, rough and noisy. Yeah. Cause you could hear the engine and everything. And we had, we had our big duffel bags, you know, with all of our stuff in it. I could never figure this out, but this is the United States army or military. We got there and that's what I slept on actually on a plane. And 
we had to take everything out and put them in these big bins. I'm thinking, why didn't they make me do that back there? Well, later on in that year when we were going through the monsoons and we needed those jackets, the Arvins had our jackets on. So they were warm and we were cold. We had given up our jackets when we first got there. And now I thought, yeah, this is real dumb, I think. (laughs) Someone did not anticipate well, they weren't going out where we were going. That's yeah. people that, that had us do that. They, yeah. But you landed in Cameron Bay and, yes. um, what, did, how long before you were out in the field? Well, I, um, I was supposed to go through a five day training and call it orientation. And the second day, uh, they needed a medic in my company that I ended up in. So they flew me up to uh, Chulai, and I went out to Charlie Company, C Company, uh, 3rd Battalion, 21st uh, Regiment, Infantry Regiment of the 196th Brigade, which actually became the last unit to leave Vietnam later on, became a unit with them themselves. And uh, we were with the AmeriCal Division. AmeriCal Division is very interesting because it's the only division with a name and a number. Every division has a number, and we are the 23rd Division. But they were formed in World War II in New Caledonia. So they took Caledonia and America and called it the AmeriCal Division. And um, it was the largest division in Vietnam. And and there I was. Um, And so they sent you out after they sent you out after two days. After two days, I was. I got off a helicopter, and this is an interesting story, too. There in front of me were two guys to greet me. One of them had his hair helmet on crooked, and he had tooth missing in front, and he talked real slow. And the other one, about every fourth word, was a swear word. He'd been out there long enough to to get a new vocabulary. And um, I, I literally said, Lord, you put me in a life and death situation, and these are the two guys that are going to save my life. Well, within a couple of days, I learned that both of those gentlemen were, had a high school education. Of course, I had a college degree. And, and this is my story when I tell kids, you got to know when to lead and know when to follow. They had a master's degree in being soldiers. And I did everything they told me to do. I tell people I was smart enough to know how dumb I was at that particular time. And, and first impressions aren't your best impressions at times because those two guys did save my life. My very first day, very first day, we ran into an ambush. So I had two very badly wounded soldiers to work on. I had two that were killed in that attack, and I killed my first human being. And I literally went into shock when I saw that man flip backwards, and literally flip backwards, and I knew I'd killed him. And this guy that had the tooth missing, he slapped me. And he said, Doc, that's the way it's going to be. It'll be either you or the other guy. And there was my first lesson from this man that knew what I was in at that particular time. You had, and of course, you know, a lot of people don't realize medics carried guns. They, they, that, that, Vietnam was the first time that medics carried guns. Yeah. And, and what you had your army rifle and a pistol. I had, a, I had an M16. And, and often I gave that up because I needed both hands to do what it was I had to do. That left me defenseless uh, as far as being able to um, fire back. But, um, yeah, I, I carried an M16. I, um, yeah, I, I fought. I, Did you carry a pistol also? No, sir. No, just, sir. Just the Army rifle, the M16. Yep, Army rifle and some extra rounds for my – M60 machine gunner. <laughs> then, then you had, I mean, when you shot the, the guy and mm-hmm. killed him, it, it, you know, it, it just kind of sent you into a, a, a different state of mind. You know, I'll, I'll piggyback off of that. 
I was speaking to a middle school in Zealand, Michigan, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. I was supposed to sing a song, give a 45 minute speech, and then have a question and answer time. When I got there, the principal said, you know, uh, we don't have school this afternoon, so we're rotating our class. Can you do that three times? So I'd talk to the eighth graders, I'd talk to the seventh graders, did my thing twice, and I was on my sixth graders. They all had been sitting in front of me on the floor. And we got into the Q&A section and a lady in the back, I assume she was a teacher, said, we have time for one more question. And a little girl jumped up off to my right. And innocently, she looked at me and said, have you ever killed anyone? And how did it make you feel? We speak at 125 words a minute and we think at 525 words a minute and 525 words were going through my head. And in 20 minutes, I said to myself, Jim, I'd never been asked that question, never. You have to tell her the truth, tell her so she'll understand, but leave her on a positive note. And I, I don't know why she asked the question. Uh, maybe her grandfather had been in war. Uh, maybe her dad was in Afghanistan, but she was sincere. And I said, honey, that's the worst thing about war. Sometimes you have to take someone else's life so that they won't take yours. But I've, I've never been proud of it. As a matter of fact, it will bother me my entire life that I took somebody's dad, somebody's son, somebody's husband, somebody's brother, somebody's uncle, somebody's friend. But, you know, I was a medic. And sometimes we would wound the enemy and I got to patch him up. So I told her the truth and I told her so I hope she would understand as a little girl. And I left her on that positive note that I could patch them up. Right. Jim, how long were you in Vietnam? I was there exactly one year. I got there on March the 7th and I left on March the 6th. March the 7th, 1969 to March the 6th, 1970. And how many combat missions did you go on? Well, we, we, we didn't know where the enemy was. We could be attacked. It, there were no front lines in Vietnam. That's what made it such a, a war uh, of all wars. Uh, so I was in the field um, for um, the majority of the time. And then near the end, they thought I was going to get killed because I did do what I was supposed to do, and that was a dangerous job. And uh, I ended up as the liaison for the Americal Division in the 91st Evacuation Hospital in Chulai for the, the latter part of my, my tour. But I was there exactly one year. You saw a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, what was the worst situation that you had to deal with? Well, the worst situation, of course, is... Uh, losing somebody that you talked to five minutes ago. Uh, the other situations are triage when you have mass casualties and you know that one person you can't save because um, you don't have a doctor here and you don't have the equipment. And so you have to do triage and leave that person alone and, and work on those that you can. A lot of people don't know that the medic's job really is to put people back into the fight that, you know, so you, you have more people that are, are uh, fighting alongside each other. But of course, we are also there uh, to save those that we possibly can. The battle that I was in where there was um, 89 of us combat assaulted in and they did no forward observation. Um, we, uh, we went up against, uh, later found out 2,700 Vietnamese uh, enemy soldiers. They had 2,700 and you had 89. We were out number 30 to one. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And, and I was wounded three times. I went into the kill zone 10 times during that battle. Um, an interesting story, click ahead to 2019. Here I am out in this battle in 1969. And the first man that I saved is uh, Bill Arnold. And um, I received a letter 2019. In the June of 2019, and it went kind of like this. You don't know me, and I don't know you, 
but you saved my grandpa in 1969. And my mom was born at Fort Knox, Kentucky, when my dad came home in 1970, and I was born in 1991. And last week, my wife and I had a baby boy. And this Sunday, I get to celebrate Father's Day because of you. And I had never, I read that to my wife with tears in my eyes. And she said, Jim, you did not save 10 Americans from being killed and captured and one Vietnamese interpreter. You saved 11 family trees. And I had never thought of it that way. So, yeah, that, that, that was the worst time. But I was also on a hill called LZ East when it was overran one night. And in uh, around 20 minutes, we had 17 killed. I was the only medic on the hill. We had 17 killed and 34 wounded. And um, many of them were burnt badly because uh, the North Vietnamese sappers had come up the hill with flamethrowers and had sh uh, shot the flames into the, uh, some of the bunkers. And so that was a bad night. That was a bad night, too. What event or action was the one that uh, you received the Congressional Medal of Honor for? The one that I told you, the battle for New Yon Hill, where we were outnumbered. Um, it, it's an interesting, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the short version. Um, <laughs> that was in May, May 13th through the 15th of 1969, that the battle for New Yon Hill took place. Four months later, my platoon leader, Lieutenant Clark, came up to me and he said, Doc, I put you in for the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest medal. But one of my superior officers, who, uh, by the way, was nowhere near that battle, he was back in nice, safe ferry. He told me you were nothing but a private first class, and they don't get that. So put you in for the Bronze Star. And I looked at that lieutenant, and I said, sir, I am not here. I am not here for medals and ribbons on my chest. I just want to get home and be a teacher, a coach, and a dad. I got that bronze star and I received another one for valor. You can get it for meritorious service or valor. Um, 40 years later, that lieutenant in 2009 went back after the Distinguished Service Cross. Since I'm making this short, six years and four months later, he finally got it from the Human Relations Committee to the Army Board of Decorations and Awards, which is where it has to be to start. Took him six years and four months. A year goes by and he calls me, that'd be 2016. He says, hey, have you heard anything? I said, no, I thought you probably had. And they, they raised it to the Silver Star and maybe they'll give it to me later on. Maybe they just rejected it, I don't know. But I said, I'll call Debbie Stabenow, who was the Lieutenant's uh, congresswoman that was handling the case. Well, I got her secretary and she said, well, I'll call you back. She called me back. She says, oh, it's good news. It's up the Pentagon. Oh, I said, well, how long did that take? She said, well, there's a new guy up there. And he said, it'd take a while. I said, let me tell you what, about, what a while is. Because by that time it was uh, 47 years. Well, we, uh, we knew it was up there. We, my wife and I, we were out Three months. That was August 2016. In October, we were out in Colorado moving her daughter into a house at an IHOP, and we got a call. I didn't recognize the number, so I declined it. Uh, we got another call, and I, rec uh, I didn't recognize it, but I did recognize that it was the same one I had declined. They left a message, but I'm going to try to play this loud enough. Senator Debbie Stabenow. Debbie, I, I not can you hear it? Home also. I just wanted to touch base with you because, as you know, we've been working to recognize your, get your service recognized in Vietnam. And the exciting news is that our defense secretary, Ash Carter, just contacted me that he's going to recommend your uh, heroic uh, services in the war for the Medal of Honor which is given to very few people, and uh, it, it's a very exciting thing. And so congratulations for that. Uh, 
So that's that's Debbie Stabenow. Yeah. And so that was the first time you heard about the Medal of Honor in relation to you. Yeah, yeah, in relation to me. I knew that it had gotten up to the Pentagon, but that was the Distinguished Service Cross that the lieutenant's working on once Ash Carter got it. And you need two eyewitness letters. 32 of us walked out of that battle. Not all were killed, of course, but we had a lot wounded badly. 32 of us walked out, and that lieutenant got nine eyewitness letters nine so that's when asking now the rest of the story though is that must be given within five years and at that time it's 47 years so debbie stabenow had to write up a bill to waive the five-year stipulation to pass in the house and the senate it did in december of 2016 heard from trump in, in may of 2017 and received the congressional medal of honor in July of 2017. So 48 years after the action. And then the ne next day I was actually inducted into the Hall of Heroes at the Pentagon, uh, August the 1st. And, and did, did was that one where you could take your family and your friends as well? Yes, and that, that I spoke at that one. You could actually bring that up on YouTube if you'd like the Jim McLuhan uh, Hall of Heroes and you'll hear my speech. You'll hear Mattis speak, you'll hear Millie speak. Um, a lot of important people there, the, the uh, sec acting secretary of the army spoke, and then I spoke and as probably uh, one of the best speeches, um, that I've ever given, uh, because of, um, the nature of it. It was, it was just very humbling, um, and, and just surreal that, that a, a little boy from, you know, Bangor, Michigan walked to a one room country school a mile every day, no electricity. And, you know, it was just surreal. Only in America can that happen. I agree. You know, uh, I grew up on a farm in Dimmit, Texas, up between Amarillo and Lubbock. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have electricity until I was in the fourth grade and didn't have running water until the next year, the fifth grade. And my parents instilled in me a hard drive of work mm -hmm. hard, do what's right. And everything mm -hmm. would work out. My dad had an eighth grade education. My mother had graduated from high school. So I was the first person in my family to go to college. Mm -hmm. And uh, in college, my roommate was a guy named Ed Whitaker. He was the first person to his family to ever go to college. And he became CEO and chairman of the board of AT&T for 18 years. And when General Motors went broke, he was selected to be the CEO and chairman of the board to turn it around and he's the one that turned it around. So only in America. Yeah, yeah. only in America could mm -hmm. we. I told him one time I said, you know, uh, Dean Allen who was the dean of students when we were there, I said, wouldn't he be proud of us? We were in the congressional dining room having having lunch. I said, wouldn't Dean Allen be proud of us? And Ed looked at me and he said, no, he'll be shocked. I thought everybody else lived like that when I was, you know, yeah, again, uh, I'll I'll repeat. We we weren't poor. We just didn't have any money there. Our table wasn't as loaded as somebody else's table, but we got something to eat most of the time. And yeah, we were warm in the winter because dad, dad and I cut up the wood and split it. Of course, back then, you know, they didn't have chainsaws. They, we cut them trees down with those big, big uh, saws that you use back and forth. Biggest lesson I ever learned, I learned uh, in, in, in Vietnam. And I'm going to share that with you because I, I feel it, 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 it belongs to everyone. And, and, and I'll give you an assignment at the end. It was the second day of the battle and somebody yelled, medic. And so I ran out into the kill zone. The kill zone is the enemy firing at my men and my men firing at the enemy. And I'm in the middle of that rescuing an individual. He had a stomach wound, so I couldn't move him. So I'm a sitting duck. I did get hit with an AK-47 round. I put the pressure bandages on because the organs were trying to seep out. And then I took my water and I didn't have anything to eat or drink for two days. I used my water on all my wounded soldiers and I wet those brush pressure bandages down because if I didn't, his organs could dry up and he would die anyway. I gently finally got him the way I needed him. And I pulled him into a trench line that the French had left there during the French Vietnamese war. 
And I'm thinking, how am I going to carry this guy through the crossfire into our perimeter? I can't throw him over my shoulder like I did everybody else because it would undo what I did. So I finally decided I would cradle him like a baby and hold the pressure bandages close to my body. And that would hold them on better and run through the crossfire. And that was one of the times it was good that I was short because I could get really close to the ground. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, a thought came over me. It had been since I was a very small boy that I had told my father that I loved him. As you probably experienced growing up, dads didn't say that to their boys and boys didn't say that to their dads or to their brothers or any other man, really. And I I had a conversation with the Lord and I said, Lord, if you get me out of this hell, so I can look my dad in the face just one more time and tell him that I love him. I'll be the best coach. I'll be the best teacher. And I'll be the best dad that I can possibly be. And I ran to my father in the O'Hare airport when I got home, threw my arms around him, told him that I loved him. He did the same thing back at me as if we'd been doing that regularly for 24 years of my life so far. I was 24. And that was our our greeting and our departure from then on. And I taught my children, my grandchildren. I coached 133 teams in high school and football, wrestling, baseball, and American Legion ball. I taught my 72 assistant coaches that that, those three words are okay to say. And this is the assignment I'm giving you. There must be somebody out there, not on purpose, but you've been too busy or whatever to tell them those three words. So today you're going to contact them. And you're going to tell them, and whoever's listening, you can take this assignment too. You're going to tell them those three words, I love you, and you're going to tell them why you love them. That's the most important lesson that I learned in a war of all wars, in hell of all hell that I've ever been through. And I want everybody to know that this medal that I have around my neck belongs to the 89 men. Not, this is not a Jim McLuhan award. This belongs to 89 men, whether they died in that battle or they made it through or they were badly wounded. And there are a lot of people you need. Remember, I told you about those two eyewitness letters. There are a lot of people that did things that normally would, you would award the Medal of Honor for, but nobody saw them do it. It's not the medal, but the action that counts it's what we do for we're not put on this good earth to serve ourselves my father taught me at a very young age jim if you're given a job to do never do it halfway do it to the best of your ability and do it till the job is done and that's why i didn't go in when the lieutenant told me to get on a plane that first night that i was wounded in that battle my job i'd rather be dead in a rice paddy than alive in a hospital and find out that one of my men didn't uh, survive because Jim McLuhan didn't uh, stay until the job was done. And so whatever it is you do, uh, you'll have more joy doing it for other people than you will have do if you're looking for something that's going to be an accolade for you. It's better to give than receive. Always. Jim, before I let you go, one of the things that I wanted to do was get you to sing uh, for us. Uh, you're an accomplished singer, and I wish you'd just sing a little for us. I'll, here's what I end with a lot of times. I gladly stand up next to you, defend her still today. Because there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. That is great. That is a great way to to end our program, uh, I, I can tell you, I could talk to you all day. Uh, this, this has been most enjoyable, uh, how proud, uh, I am for you and how proud we American public are for you. And you know, you're, you're very humble, but also you're proud of what you did and that in America that you've been able to do so much, 
uh, that uh, God has blessed you beyond belief. Well, sir, thank you for your leadership and all that you've done for so many in, in this great country and also for your program, because there are a lot of people that are going to be listening to the various programs that you have. And that's the only way that they can hear some of these things that uh, you you produce. So wonderful, man. Uh, again, you're serving a multitude of people uh, when you do these particular uh, co- podcasts. Jim, thank you very much. God bless you and God bless the United States of America.